OTB AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. A very good morning. You're welcome along to a special edition of OTB AM. This is the OTB AM time capsule of 2021. We're here with you for the next little while to go through some of our favourite sporting memories or not so favourite sporting memories of the last 12 months and decide what will go into our 2021 time capsule. It's Owen and Ger here in studio. Adrian and Nathan are with us as well. Ger, first of all, go Christmas. Yeah, not bad at all. It was uh, nice of you to, to bring your um, little brother, the elf on the shelf, with you today to work. Yeah. Is, it, is it bring your child to work day? It, it certainly is. I've never noticed the uh, similarity between you and the elf before, but <laughs> it's a chip off the old block. Yeah, it really is. Um, I, get, I, I get that quite a lot. Do you? Uh, uh, a lot of people still this, right? It's, it's, a thing. I mean, it's, an, it's kind of like an endear- a term of endearment or just a kind of a, a weird term of... Uh, of attraction or something like that, I guess is is probably what uh, people is what I'm taking from it. You know. Okay, fair enough. Um, yeah. Nathan, how are you? Hot elves. <laughs> I'm. <laughs> Got weird right from the start. I'm uh, very well, very well, thank you. Uh, any plans for New Year's? Obviously, a quiet one. Owen, um, you know, taking all the advice on board, going to have a quiet one. Adrian, how are you? <laughs> any Jules plans? What's happening? They, uh, you lose track of time, don't you? Quite, yeah. I can't even remember what date it is anymore. It's what day of the week it is, what day it is. You just some would say Christmas. we don't even know what day this is going out on. It was the how much we've actually lost Christmas in the intervening uh, days between Christmas and New Year's. Any any New Year's traditions, lads? I mean, this is a, a pretty sort of uh, we're all following guidelines. Nobody's nobody's got anything going on. Adrian, surely you've got something going on this week for New Year's. No, I used to have a life. I did have a tradition, right? Going out in the lash, particularly around uh, Stephen's Day on. But yeah, no, and everything's been like we'd sort of tend to toggle from going to my wife's place and then my place at sort of uh, Christmas Day. But yeah, everything has been open the earth at the minute. So um, yeah, I don't know. Create new traditions, all. That's what it's all about. Embrace the weirdness. Absolutely. Well, uh, thanks a million for being with us all year. It's been one hell of a year of sport, although uh, none of us saw any of it live for, for the first six months or so. So what we're going to do over the next little while is we're going to go through some of the moments of the year, put them into a time capsule and kind of assess how they sum up the year. We're going to have Phil with us later on. We're going to have Ashling and Tommy with us later on. We're going to have uh, Ronan and Colin with us later on as well. So there's plenty to get into uh, after the next 40 minutes or so. But we want to start with some of the main stories of the year. Joe, I think you're going to kick us off uh, with a little bit on the football. Yeah, OK. So... We were talking about not really knowing what time it is in the... I'm going to uh, open the kimono and show you how the sausage is made a little bit here. In the pre-show meeting, I was like, was the game in Faro this year? Was that this last 12 months? And I was, it was confirmed to me that yes, it was. In fact, it was, it was like in the last five months. It was like, like that, it, I was very recently. I, it doesn't feel very recently. It feels like a lot has changed since that game. So... You've got, to, you've got to spool back a little bit. So I'm talking Republic of Ireland football team here. And it was also in this year that Luxembourg came to Dublin and beat us in an empty stadium. That's correct. It was. That, that, that was this year. March, wasn't it? Yeah. And then we had the Azerbaijan game and not great performances. And the mood music around Stephen Kenny and what he was trying to do was pretty bleak at that point. There were significant calls for him not to be renewed, for him to go. That was growing. People had less than uh, sympathy with what he was trying to achieve. We're passing the ball too much out from the back. The team has no shape, no identity. What's the culture of the team? What's the selection? It changed, it chopped and changed, and it chopped and changed partially because of uh, COVID regulations, because of availability, unavailability due to people not getting vaccinated. Whatever reason it was, you know, it was, it was unfortunate that COVID was taking caps from people, but it, COVID did take caps from people. And then the game of Faro happened and uh, Portugal had their full team out with uh, Jada and Bruno and obviously Cristiano. Uh, Silva was playing, Ruben Diaz and Pepe, João Cancelo. It's a good team mm. they have. And they ripped us apart for the first seven, eight, nine minutes. Ten minutes in, Gavin Pizzuno, bit of a howler, penalty given away, and you're like, ooh. And Ronaldo needed that goal to break the international record, right? So it was, uh, well, at least um, going to have an Irish goalkeeper. Was it to equal the record at that stage? Maybe it was to break it? I can't remember. It was certainly, Ali Dia's record was in his sights. And it looked for all the world like we were staring in the barrel of a five or six nil and an ignominious end. This could have been Cyprus, this could have been that mm. that uh, hoary old day in Cyprus that we uh, conceded five goals with Paddy Canyon goals. But no, there's a flash of blue, Gambazuna saves. And the team is, I think, in that moment, forged 
in the fire of Pharaoh. And the steal that they got from that, granted they lose the game in fairly horrific circumstances at the end with Ronaldo ripping his shirt off and the referee giving a hug or a lick. Sorry, a yellow card and uh, and smiling as he did it. Uh, but I, I thought that in that moment a lot changed. They, the team somehow got this jolt of confidence. They realised that they've got a world-class player in goals. Granted, he's playing in League One at the moment, but he's, he is world-class and Gavin Bazuna is going to go on and have a 200-cap career. And I think that that was a huge... The, 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 the quality of the performance from there until we concede is excellent. We create a number of chances. The goal is excellent. Uh, the quality of football is, is great. Um, Jamie McGrath looks like an international footballer on his debut. I think even more importantly, there's a substitution where Daryl Shea unfortunately is out and uh, suffers a horrific injury. But Andrew Amavamadeli comes on and plays beautifully, like is at the end of the game, still creating uh, opportunities for us and passing the ball forward. And it's like, so we've got loads of good young players here who are confident on the ball and desperate to make an impact. And I, I think that like if I if there's a time capsule from this year for me, it's it's not the successive three 0 away wins. It's actually against a team that is littered with Champions League winners and Premier League winners and Cup winners and like a multitude of caps. This young team found something within themselves and the confidence to play some football and to keep possession as opposed to just hoofing it. We also had the I mean, the mind-altering moment where Matt Doherty and Seamus Coleman are starting a game at the same time and they last the full 90 minutes together on the pitch. It's like, wow, if only we'd ever had a football brain who was big enough to work out. Matt Doherty could play on the left and James Coleman could play on the right. And that might be a way to get them both on the field at the same time, given that we have uh, a dearth of Premier League players. But look, mm. we all know that that didn't happen. The 45 minutes they had in Gibraltar was proof that Mick McCarthy uh, needed that they couldn't play together. And then Stephen Kenny came in and blew away the era that, that had passed previously and I think has changed football for, I hope, the next couple of years we're going to play good football and see where it takes us. Because that's the interesting I think, Nathan, you were tweeting about that during the Euros when Portugal got knocked out being like, no pressure, Republic of Ireland, uh, the next team to fall victim to Cristiano Ronaldo as he's chasing or trying to beat Ali Day's uh, record. So there, there was a kind of tone around Ireland at the time where it's like, God, they've beaten Andorra under Stephen Kenny and that was it. That there, there wasn't actually this real sense of expectation that something special could happen in Faro. Not that it did, but it came so close. No, and I think Stephen Kenny probably maybe point to those games against Andorra and Hungary and the 10 days together that the players had uh, over in the training camp in Portugal is maybe the turning point. But I think on the pitch it was that Gavin Bazunu say, firstly, for what it meant to Gavin Bazunu as a 19-year-old playing League One football to deny Ronaldo in that moment. But Ireland were massively under the cosh. And think about how they gave away that penalty. It was a shocking mistake from Bazunu. It was overplaying at the back. It was all of the criticisms that the Kenny era had taken on board in one moment of, why are you doing this against Portugal? Why are you overplaying? But Ireland survived and kicked on and performed brilliantly. And to be honest... I was at the Viva Stadium after the game against Luxembourg in March and I thought that was it. I thought it might trundle on till the end of the campaign, but there was no way back for Stephen Kenny. You cannot lose at home to Luxembourg in the fashion that Ireland did. But for them to turn it around, starting with that game against Portugal, even though there was the setback against Azerbaijan to follow, but to end the year the way they did, I think in a couple of years' time, if Ireland end up at the European Championship Finals, that we will look at that Bazuna moment as a real turning point and I think Kenny and the coaching staff deserve enormous credit because this last year was a write-off because of COVID and all the issues but it rolled on in then to the late concessions over in Serbia where Ireland played well for 70 minutes and then the hangover of that continues into Luxembourg and suddenly it's one win in was it 13, 14, 15 games managers don't usually come back from that so to have actually held their nerve to have continued to try and play a really progressive intense style of football to continue to show their faith in young players and as Jer said to throw on Andrew Omobamadele if people ask about you know what would the difference be if a different manager Andrew Omobamadele doesn't come on there wasn't Darryl in the squad wouldn't on. have been in the squad Daryl Lennon comes on like, Ogbeni is not playing in these two or three games we're sticking with somebody who's in or around the championship side we're sticking with somebody who has 20 caps and we're not taking any risks at all 
And Ireland now, I think, are going to see the benefits of that next year in the Nations League. Unfortunately, 2022 is a weird year for international football with the World Cup, which means that if you're looking at World Cup qualifiers as uh, our European Championship qualifiers, the next real competitive games were still 18 months away. But I think there's an awful lot to look forward to with the progression this side of May. And the Nations League is big. It big is. Big for our... It is. I, I know uh, there's a confusion there that you are, I would say, mainly responsible for our own amongst the Irish <laughs> public. But actually... Stephen Kenny has been very bullish. He's come out and said he wants to top his group. Mm. If Ireland can do that, like Stephen Kenny can almost start thinking about a World Cup qualifying campaign again because you're guaranteed a playoff for the European Championships. You've got a brilliant chance of getting there. You've all the momentum. In fact, if you win your group, you're going into the qualifiers for the Euros thinking, we're going to qualify. But also suddenly you're in League A. Suddenly Spain are coming to town. And all that nonsense. And again, a year of absolute nonsense and bullshit around the scenes of this Irish team of... Well, Stephen Kenny, well, maybe he'll have to go because they, they don't have a shirt sponsor. Well, the they video, sorry, no, the, the, the video. The well, video, the video was still. this time last year. The video was this time last year. But again, it rumbled on for another six months and came up time and time again. There have been any amount of little stories behind the scenes, but everything has been laid on Stephen Kenny. Nothing seems to belong to the previous 10 years and the way Irish football has been treated. And I think himself and the players and the management team deserve huge credit that somehow they are ending this year on a real high, with a real buzz. It feels with the entire nation behind them. The atmosphere that night against Portugal for that scoreless draw, there was a sense of this is something we believe in, this is something we want to be part of. And I don't think anyone thought that that would have been possible coming out of Luxembourg, even though there was only 20 of us there, uh, coming out of the Luxembourg game in March. They've started, to, we're starting to see Ireland players play the best football of their career for Ireland. It's, you know, it, there would, that definitely would have happened under Jack Charlton. Uh, even though those players played in massive, massive games, but you you frequently saw players put in their best performances. Like Keane's performances for Ireland under Mick McCarthy were as good as anything he ever did for Manchester United as well. So, like, uh, you know, we hadn't seen that in a long period of time, I would say, but we're seeing Shane Duffy play his best football. We're seeing, uh, like, John Egan has rediscovered form that was at least as good as his best form in the Premier League was. Jeff Hendrick playing football. You know, uh, that hadn't happened. Um, you've definitely got to say that then the likes of Ogbené are playing above a League One standard. Uh, you've got you've got an argument to be made that uh, I know Callum Robinson's been banging in goals in the Championship this season, but uh, what he did over those couple of games post uh, post his COVID uh, vaccination situation where James was, McLean. It was like a level of flame he hadn't found. Yeah, um, so so that's definitely the case. Like Adrian, are you riding this this positive wave into 2022? The main thing I'm taking away from this is Jarrah says is saying that Mick McCarthy is responsible for bringing the best out of Roy Keane, which is uh, that is the revelation of the year. No matter what else is uh, what else is discussed. Um, ah, yeah, totally. And like just when you talk about that, the uh, Ronaldo goals. Like I remember Eamon Dunphy was it, was it with us the next morning. At some point, he was saying that it was one of the, I think it was it was the most devastating thing he's seen in sport, and it was hard to get away from that. It was sat at the edge of my seat looking at it. And it was just a total gut punch. And I think that, like, for all the positivity that we've seen since, like, there was, that was a pivotal moment because we were start, sort of starting to prove that we could lose whichever way you want. And, like, even from a player's point of view, at some stage or another, you start to think, Jesus, this guy's cursed. And no matter what good work is going on, how are we going to get past this? So, you know, there's absolute... I'm, I'm all aboard, and I think the credit that goes to the players in that context as well, because look, at you see what's going on at Manchester United over the last couple of months where uh, when things started to go to pot a little bit, that they can just, just as easily look after themselves and get the hell out of there. But they've obviously identified that this guy, who a lot of them will have known, some some of them will have known, and a lot of them will have known nothing about, um, but they're very clearly um, aboard his train and what he's doing. And with that style of football, and, you know, at what point are we going to get to a stage? Obviously, we'll get to a stage at some point where we start talking about the future of Stephen Kenny, but also that that becomes the Irish personality of playing football wouldn't that be what a legacy that would be for Stephen Kenny if that could be something that could be achieved but like that's a 20, 30, 40 year conversation really I think Adrian the Manchester United comparison is a good one and I know the Seamus Coleman to Manchester United ship has long since sailed at this stage but Kenny has been very fortunate with the senior players and the type of character the senior players are in that squad remember he has dropped Seamus Coleman he's dropped Shane Duffy he's dropped James McLean and none of them have thrown their toys out of the pram. All of them have put the head down and fought their way back into the team again. And I think a lesser caliber of player would start letting a few little noises come out that the camp wasn't happy 
where actually those three have stuck by him. Well, hang on a always second. said the right thing. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. That's interesting you bring that up because there were there was it was written in the papers. The, the press put it in print that they were unhappy and it was immediately rubbished. McLean came out publicly and said rubbish, absolute nonsense. Uh, Coleman made a point of going out in in a press conference and saying I was reading that I was upset about being asked to do media in advance of a game I wasn't playing in. It's nonsense. It didn't happen. I thought like it's it's even more pronounced the point you're making is is excellent. It's even more pronounced that they 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 went to bat at times of crisis for the manager and everybody has been repaid by a massive uplift in support in just the sense of joy about going to watch the football team and how exciting it is. You're on the edge of your seat, you're not bored, it's entertaining. I don't know, all good for uh, now. Uh, you've also got to like look at the timing of some of those defences as well. Like Coleman and McLean came out in defence of this whole project when it was easier to not do that. Like Stephen Kenny, when he goes on that long defence of his own methods and really hits back at some of the critics, like it, that's the 6th of September, so that's right after the one-all draw with Azerbaijan. We'd come off the high of Farrow and the Azerbaijan draw had put Ireland back into a tricky space again almost immediately. And yet it's at that moment that Stephen Kenny picks to go on a, on a big defence. So this isn't necessarily bandwagon hopping by anybody on this occasion. When the chips were down the players and certainly the manager came out swinging and, and that is something that you kind of can point to as, as reasons why that adversity has been turned around and why it actually might point to a pretty positive 2022 as well. I'm not surprised that the players defended them and even going right back to the conversations just after Martin O'Neill left as to should Stephen Kenny have got the job then or should it be Mick McCarthy and would the players respect him? You could have looked around that dressing room and known firstly he has the connections with James McLean and Shane Duffy going back to Derry but also Seamus Coleman Unfortunately, I've interviewed him 20 times outside Goodison Park where an Everton manager has been on the verge of the sack. And not once ever would he turn on a manager. He, you know, and it's not, it's not for show, that he looks around a dressing room when things aren't going well and looks at the players and asks what they're doing. So I'm not in any way surprised. And Kenny did come out fighting and needed to come out fighting. And I think he's at his best when he's coming out fighting, when he's really passionate. I remember when he was in studio during the year talking about his, his heart attack with the 21s and when it eventually turned to football. And... Uh, I don't think we had it on video, but he was in my face pointing his finger as he went on one for about 10 minutes defending what Irish football could be. That when he, And you can't be like that all the time, understandably. But I think the more the public sees of that side of Stephen Kenny, the better, because people care about this team. People want to care about this team. They want to go to the Viva Stadium. They want to feel something. They want an intensity and an energy and modern football. And I think the generation before this that are frustrated maybe at times with Stephen Kenny's comments where he sort of plays down a lot of what's happened in Irish football over the last 10 or 20 years. I'm not sure they're quite aware as to how disillusioned Irish football fans became under Giovanni Trapattoni, particularly the latter years, under Martin O'Neill, where Armenia, Slovakia, these teams would come to town and outplay Ireland, where we'd almost be embarrassed by what Irish football was. Whereas now I think people are coming back thinking, yes, we don't have the greatest players in the world. Yes, there's probably a limit as to what this team can achieve. But actually, this is exciting. This is a team who are going to play fast, progressive, intensive football. That's all people want. We're going That's to live, all people want. We're going a to, team that cares. Yeah, and we're going to live on the edge of our seat because, you know, at any point uh, we might have a bad back pass. So you've got to pay attention. So that is, uh, like, I mean, it's not getting away from it. It's, it's ended on a, on a hugely positive note. And I think uh, the Bazunu save, the night in Faro, I think that is our uh, men's Republic of Ireland moment that is going to be put into the time capsule of 2021 we're going to stick with football uh, Nathan and we talk about a, a team that the public has got behind I think the women's national team has just the, the interest in this team the popularity of this team has absolutely surged throughout 2021 yeah I think it's uh, 2021 has been a breakthrough year for the women's team I think 2022 could bring it to a whole other level if they finish this off and qualify for World Cup finals. Off the field, it's been a huge year. The conversations between Katie McCabe and Seamus Coleman that resulted in equal pay, which is something we spoke about consistently, which seemed a world away, an impossible thing to do before actually everyone realized this isn't a difficult situation and it puts us ahead of other sports and what we're trying to do. Then the sponsorship deal that came through with Sky, where we have Sky in the front of the women's jerseys, but no sponsor on the men's jerseys, I think was a real sign that things are going in the right direction. And then the emergence of Katie McCabe feels as mm. one of the best players in the world. 
it, there was a poll a year or so ago where Denise O'Sullivan was in the top 100 players in the world and maybe there's a bit of Denise been out of sight, out of mind over in North Carolina. But Katie McCabe, what she has done at Arsenal, best team in English football, their player of the season last season and having those sort of viral moments now where she's scoring just ridiculous, ridiculous goals. Uh, having one of those, Having one of those... Taking penalties helps, but having one of those moments where you uh, win goal of the month and you're sort of beating yourself in the goal of the month competition. The goal she scored against uh, Aston Villa uh, from 30, 40 yards out where she chips it over the keeper was just sensational. And also, I think her personality as well, that, uh, you know, she, again, she has that spirit. She has a real likability. She has an expectation, I think, of the players around her. I think Ireland still haven't fully figured out how to get the best out of her, like playing it left back. For Ireland, when she's your best player, it's sort of like the David Alaba situation. Can she play it left back for a club and play in the centre midfield for the Republic of Ireland where you can get her on the ball all the time? But there's definite signs of progression after what was a really, really tough couple of years. I think we've all interviewed some of the players after what happened against Ukraine and they know it was a chance of a lifetime that they missed out on with that defeat to Ukraine and Northern Ireland ended up qualifying for the European Championships. But to come back finally after seven defeats in a row, to beat Australia albeit in a friendly, but still one of the best teams in the world, to follow it up against Sweden uh, with a narrow defeat where, again, they created a couple of chances but had a really good shape about them, and then the all-important victory over Finland. You just hope that there's no banana skins about the way, but I think it's been a, it's been, as I say, I think it's been a breakthrough year, but I think potentially 2022 could, could go intergalactic. Hmm. It's, um, when, when you look back on it, like there's a, the automatic parallels that you make between a manager who is struggling to get the results on the pitch that, what was it, four or five of the first games of the calendar year we're actually reflecting on were all defeats. And it was, again, if you're going to, maybe it's, maybe it's a straw clutching in the men's side of things, looking at that Andorra game in the summer and less so at the women's side of things, but that friendly, that, that friendly win against Australia seems to have given them such a boost that when you're watching this team, you're like, there is something here. There is a, a closing of the gap between this team and even some of the, the top teams in the continent that, yes, that win in Finland was, was a huge result and, and maybe the, the Finns would be disappointed they didn't get something from that game but it kind of felt that that was the, the next part of this team's journey that actually going and getting a massive result like that wasn't going to be a fluke when it did eventually happen so the, the trajectory has been there like I mean the, what we have to, to factor into to all of this as well is like the, the, the league here the league in the UK you mentioned Katie McKay but even back home the insane drama on the last day of the, the, the National the, the national League here at 12 months ago could we have seen this this level of drama coming or this, this level of focus on, on the league here and on the national team coming we probably could in fairness but it's been one hell of a year where, where both things have delivered It's slow though it's slow like, it's great that that last night of the season was on TG Cahar and it certainly helps the women's game but like you're looking around the stadium there's very few people at the match you know the, Vera Powell was making the point about well, Ireland could go to the Aviva Stadium and play their games, but actually, are they going to get more than six, 7,000 at the Aviva? Maybe they're better off having a packed Tala. So I think there's been moments. It's definitely been a breakthrough, and it's heading in the right direction. But I, I'd imagine anyone closely involved in women's football, they don't want to be patting themselves on the back. Like They don't want this to be the limit. Like This has to be the start. And I think it is. I think it is the start. There's, you just have to look at what's happening in England with the WSL and the coverage of Sky. Uh, the momentum it's starting to build. But I think there is still a, a long way to go before we say that you know the women's game is exactly where it should be in this country. We're going to be chatting uh, a lot about other sports as this show goes on. One thing we're not going to touch on later on, Nathan, is golf. So if you had to pick one of your <laughs> golfing moments of the year, massive year it was, uh, which one would you pick uh, to, to put into your 2021 time capsule? Oof. From an Irish point of view, it has to be Leona Maguire at the Solheim Cup. Like, this was unbelievable. A rookie going into the Ryder Solheim Cup who had four and a half points, best ever performance from a European player to go and win a Solheim on American soil and her to be the leader of the team, basically, to go and beat the world number one, Nelly Corder, twice along the way. It, like This was one of the great Irish golfing performances and one we've waited a long, long time for from Leona Maguire. She's obviously gone about it her own way, stayed in the college system, world number one amateur for a longer period than any other female golfer in history and has this breakthrough year and what's still technically her rookie year on the LPGA 
has a second place finish early in the season. And I remember talking to her, I think the week after that, about Solheim Cup and almost talking about it in a jokey fashion. I was talking about it in a jokey fashion. You could tell from Leona that you know, she knew that this was a realistic possibility. It almost overshadows the fact that she had the lowest round ever in a major championship by a male or female when she had a 61 at the Evian Championship. Like one of the greatest rounds in major championship history and never got the win, which I'm sure will be a frustration. But as I say, technically her rookie season as a professional, even though she is 26, and the Solheim, the momentum that was built over the course of that weekend and to finish with four and a half points, I think was just, uh, yeah, it's it's something something she can live off for as long as, long as she wants. Uh, on the men's side, we judged it all in majors. So... Uh, unfortunately, there wasn't one. A couple of good wins, well, a couple of wins for Rory along the way, but the usual ups and downs. The ripped shirt, uh, Shane Lowry. What do you make of the ripped, ripped shirt? shirt? It's been a, what a five, six weeks ago now at this stage. Mm. Uh, that's what I'm going to remember from this season. <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing that stands out. Ah, what? Yeah. What? Come on, honestly, what the hell is he doing, ripping his own clothes at the end of a tournament? I think it's just a sign of. Well, it's a weird. massive inner frustration. Well, I mean, it is, but it's it's, it's very weird. Of... I don't remember anybody doing it. I don't remember any golfers doing it. What's going on, Rory? We Just that week, he was like, "Oh, every life week is great." What is going on? Yeah, uh, it seems to be very up and down with Rory constantly. Uh, he figures something out, and then there's another issue, and he figures it out, and then there's another issue. Yeah. And it feels as though we're heading into the Masters next year, where yet again he'll be going for the career Grand Slam, and yet again there'll be. Any amount of question marks about where his game is. And yeah, it's, I think everyone's getting a bit peeved at the moment. They just want some sort of consistency from him. Uh, it ain't going to happen. But, uh, happen. Unfortunately, it's it's not coming. Uh, like the big disappointment from an Irish point of view was was the Ryder Cup because obviously it was Harrington's, Harrington's Ryder Cup and to suffer, you know, a huge, huge defeat like that. Um, I know it's not going to massively tarnish his legacy, but I think it's something that will stick for quite a while. It's there. You, you, like you can't, you, you, you can't make that big a deal out of the Ryder Cup and then say it doesn't matter. I, you just can't. You golfers, but that is the you Ryder golf Cup, fans. But that is the Ryder Cup. No, you can't is, have it. That is no, literally no. The Ryder Cup you spend five hundred quid and a bit of a, a bit of out tat from the Ryder Cup, and you're like, oh look, it's five hundred quid, and they say, oh, it doesn't matter though. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Whatever happens, it the doesn't Ryder, matter. It, it's like the lion sore. It's important while it's on, but the second it's over, does anybody really care? Yeah, I, that's I, not I, true. Look, that's not out. true. Well, actually, Hang on a second. Paul Azinger is still banging on, and Nick Faldo and Monty made a career on TV out of my Ryder Cup when I won the Ryder Cup, my Ryder Cup, my Ryder Cup. Lee Westwood is only revered in this part of the world because of what he's done. He's Polter. never won a major. Poulter has become a character, even though he is, at best, a journeyman. What was his... Like, <laughs> you, can't, you can't tell me the Ryder Cup doesn't matter. Because immediately, immediately we're going to start talking about Ryder Cup qualification, Ryder Cup points, and world ranking stuff. Like, it's, it's, it's non-stop. It's a, it's a permanent... In comparison to his three major titles, maybe in America, people will look back and say, Whew, you know, record European defeat. But there was no... There was no there was no scandal. It, it seems as though he maybe got a few little things wrong along the way, but this was an unbelievably good American yeah, side, maybe the that's best true. ever American side. That's true. We knew it was a pretty average European side. Now, as a captain, I guess you have to change the narrative there. You have to somehow figure out how you elevate those average European players. And that didn't happen. Like So many of them didn't perform. John Ram, the world number one, turned up and did perform, but... I, I, Harrington's like Roy I, Keane. I don't think it, he's like Roy Keane, right? The 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 playing career massively outshines the managerial career, and that's generally what people are going to remember. And they are both amazing pundits, who who tell it like it is, and people don't really like that too much. So I don't know if he was ever going to be a brilliant Ryder Cup captain. Uh, but it'd be, I, it's I, not I, I, career, I think, surely. Like it's one he's done. What he's he's been a, a manager slash coach slash captain for one event, whereas Roy Keane has this massive. Uh, amount to, to prove that's, that's all he get. That's all he get. He won't get another. He won't get another opportunity. And listen, the, you know, I, I'd, I'd imagine uh, the pocket has taken a severe hit because if you're a winning Ryder Cup captain, you do go on that nice little leadership circuit, and uh, where there's plenty of money to be made, and it's kind of hard to do that when you've taken an absolute beating at the hands of Harrington will uh, win a major again though Nathan the right? I mean there's a possibility <laughs> they could partner up with Paul McGinley who needs a bit of a brand refresh right they could sort of do the you know one half this is how you deal with winning and uh, the other half you know, the leadership skills that come yeah. with losing yin and yang that is, that is a, they, there, could, yeah. they could reform their world cup winning partnership 
it, it, the Ryder Cup definitely is that sort of thing, though. I have to say, I'm de- I am absolutely one of these. I felt a bit like actually my my trip to the Ireland final this weekend came to mind where I went to be decked in my Mayo gear and then sort of towards the end where it was pretty obvious it wasn't happening. I was like, all oh, right, well, this doesn't mean that much to me. I feel a bit that way uh, with the uh, Ryder Cup for sure. Like when it's getting away from you and it's like, Graham, we'll just sit back and enjoy it now. Um, but yeah, look. So we've got um, Leona Maguire and uh, her sensational uh, run in the Salon Cup going into our uh, in, into our time capsule. Once again, I almost forgot what this thing was called. Uh, Adrian, you are bringing us into rugby here. Uh, like, I mean... He's a rugby man, obviously. You are a rugby man, rugby union man. Uh, Adrian Barry, like the lines have been thrown into the mix there by Nathan there in a sort of uh, in a sort of downplaying way, even though it was extraordinary, for, maybe for all the wrong reasons this summer. And then, of course, there was Ireland going from a, a low enough ebb at the start of the year to a pretty high height at the end. Don't what was that, what's that expression? Don't take anything that man has to say. <laughs> was that one about John Delaney when it comes to Nathan? Well, Rugby? Don't don't take anything. Somebody get my has. lawyers. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't quite get the concept here, but we're going to reflect on what a, what a great year it was. I mean, sorry, for, hang on a second. Irish Rugby. Hang on um, a second. No, 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 no. I don't quite get the concept of a time capsule. <laughs> well, I don't what? know. Are we see see the, the thing. The reason I'm saying that is I was thinking like this conversation, particularly because it's Ireland versus the All Blacks that we want to focus on. And particularly in relation to that, really the most interesting time to open that up would be probably about this time in two years. Like, you know, if you open it up at 30 yeah, so years' time, it might in be, there. oh, okay, the All Blacks sort of been- uh, dipped off in the middle of a World Cup cycle and then suddenly came back and won it. Ireland won a game in the middle of a World Cup cycle and suddenly came back and flopped at a World Cup. So, so, so let's bury well, this Adrian, for two Adrian. years. Yeah, but, but Adrian, if there's a Leinster Pro 16 game that you feel is the most memorable <laughs> moment where they performed like the best team in the world, you can put that into the time. I've already made the point, Nathan, that it was pretty much Leinster and Green anyway against the All Blacks. So that was, um, that was kind of what So the what team selection, because... is that is that what you're putting into the time capsule here? You're putting no, the, the I'm, team I'm, selection. The moment there's... Leinster finally killed off everybody else. <laughs> yeah, there's like right. a... World, world domination. A, a light bulb goes off over Andy Farrell's head and he goes, well, why don't we just pick the Leinster lads? And everyone goes, I'm yeah, the... that's, that's the idea. Paul I'm putting in the kind of un- the unlikeliness of, of the entire thing, the journeys that both teams were on, and it was actually just interesting when you were chatting a bit earlier on about that sort of um, arc that Stephen Kenny is on, that Andy Farrell has been on something slightly similar because it was such a weird Six Nations, and we shouldn't forget that not that long ago, um, as in maybe three months ago at this stage, um, that people were talking about whether Andy Farrell is the right man for this uh, for this gig, and suddenly his CV is enhanced to such a point that he can go wherever the hell he wants in the game after this. I mean, it still has a couple of years, obviously, to see out, but um, yeah. Yeah, such a weird Six Nations. The Wales game, the Omani red card, um, that weird Burns selection, and then the weird Burns kick at the end. Um, and Farrell was copping a lot of heat, and that went right the way up to the start of the, uh, the autumn series and the like the opening game. And everybody was kind of saying, "Well, maybe, maybe it was just because it was Japan, and we weren't we weren't really that sure." And the the proof was always going to be against a team like the All Blacks and also by the way even when you end up beating a team like the All Blacks you have a huge cohort of people who are you know maybe not great rugby people um, like all four of us are but uh, you know who'd have you not really enjoy the occasion and uh, tell you that there's nothing to be enjoyed here it's not a World Cup it's just a friendly match etc etc but that's really papers over um, the cracks of what happened uh, in the autumn series in a, in a big way and I think there's two sides to it there's certainly the trajectory of the Irish bit that we can we can focus on but um like what an amazing few months it was for scott robertson you'd have to say who's suddenly looking at everything going on thinking well you know my time my time might come very soon um and people i i met I've, i may have mentioned this before but i lived in new zealand for a while and people do go absolutely not right. <laughs> for their rugby it's yeah, uh that the inter rugby um, i didn't know that they lived i didn't know they lived. Uh, i never knew you were with any irish players at any stage in New Zealand, or was that just when you no, were in Australia? Was, that was Australia. That was Australia. Okay. Nice. Tell us that great story again. <laughs> um, but yeah, the 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 aftermath for the All Blacks is like the airways are there been dominated by this conversation, and they go they do go like we think that we go buck crazy over stuff like the Stephen Kenny conversation, and we do, and it's a very similar conversation that happens down there. But like when you consider the facts of the fallout of that game, first time in over of those games, I should say, first time in over twenty years that the All Blacks have lost back-to-back international mm. tests. Like, if you let that sink in for a second, that's, that is just an incredible um, fact out of this. First time to lose three tests in one season for 12 years, and the first time in nearly 40 years since they lost back-to-back tests 
to Northern Hemisphere teams. Like, it really is incredible. And and I noted as well that the New Zealand Herald did a poll shortly after the France game. Uh, they polled 18,000 rugby mad Kiwis. 80% of them wanted Foster gone and Robertson in. You know, right. and like, look, I don't know if you're tuned in again from 2051 and you're like, oh, Scott Robertson, is that how Scott Robertson got the gig and he's still in the job or whatever it might be. But um, yeah, the fallout from the New Zealand side, he's he's copping loads of flack. And actually a lot of it is about that same sort of thing that um, towards the end of the Joe Schmidt era that the players aren't capable of playing what they see in front of them, which was a thing that like obviously New Zealand wrote the book on that. And suddenly um, they're saying that they're too rigidly um, sticking to the game plan. There was one great clip that we I think we might be able to bring yeah, away. Yeah, let's go for it. it yeah, do you want to introduce it there on? Yeah, well, it's a news talk ZB, one of the uh, premier stations in uh, New Zealand. Uh, we're reacting to uh, this is two weeks after the Ireland game, so it's the, news talk more like. <laughs> there was the Ireland uh, defeat, and then there was obviously the, the defeat in Paris as well, and there was a, a lot of angry phoners on news talk ZB. Have a listen. They could develop those two like by Nono and Smith. And also we kick the ball away too much. Why do we kick the ball away? And I'll make a prediction even this far out that it'll be a Northern Hemisphere team that will win the next World Cup. You know, Foster's in La La Land, if he's thinking, you know, we're just tired, we'd have a long tour. We're well and truly uh, out of it at the moment, tactically. You've got to say congratulations to the Prince, really. As long as I can still pull a hair out of my ass, the Prince will always be able to pull a rabbit out of a hat. DRS. Uh, that was the re- reaction uh, from uh, the, new, the New Zealand Who public. Hairs out of their arse is the question that I have. Uh, not the French. Uh, the um, if, we're, if we're if we're talking about this in a, in a proper sort of uh, time capsule sense, like are, are we okay with this New Zealand win for Ireland going into this time capsule and in two no. years' time it comes out and the reaction is ah well at least we had our fun or does no. or, or will we be humiliated? looking back on any sort of happiness to do with this game in two years' time if Ireland don't get past another quarterfinal. Which is it? Uh, I'm, I'm maybe not best judged to comment on this because I like my rugby, like I like my Christmas. You know, my enjoyment is dependent on how much wine I've had while uh, in the midst of it. And I had no wine at all while watching yeah, uh, where the All Blacks. <laughs> <laughs> I had no wine at all while watching that All Blacks game, so it was just grand. Uh, surely it's just a moment going into the time capsule from this year. It's just got to be Razzie Erasmus. Yeah. Yeah, ah, look, look, that was hugely entertaining. And it's, 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 and, and like there is obviously. Take off your green tinged glasses. No, he doesn't like, understand look, the concept, Nathan. Leave it. No, leave it, no, Jake. No, it's Chinatown. No. My, my blue tint, uh, blue tint glasses. Sorry, those couple of weeks, right weeks were some of the greatest sporting weeks of the year. As I say, the lines doesn't really matter. But we went from a situation where the players are sitting in their hotel room an hour before a game where they don't even know what's going to happen because everybody is COVID. We thought everyone was going to be sent home. From that into eventually getting it all together, winning the first test. Razzy Erasmus, one of the greatest sporting videos of all time. And you're talking about an end of season victory against an All Blacks team. That no, are absolutely no, 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 shattered. no, 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 no. I'm going to stop you there, Bill, because the, you're you're vastly underplaying what happened. It's of course it is beating the All Blacks, but the the key point in all this was that Andy Farrell started out the year certainly post six nations in a position where everybody was Alice, Stephen Kenny talking about whether this guy was headed in the right direction. Uh, do we need to make a change in the middle of a World Cup cycle? And now suddenly. We're talking about um, the huge depth that we have in the various positions. Like, even if you looked at the starting 15 that started against New Zealand, you'd be saying to yourself, well, that was some sort of a second string team with loads of injuries. And we had to fire in a lot of inexperienced players. Like, But that's where we're at now. Like, genuine competition. The only concern that you'd have after... And that's why I'd say, look, at the, the Rasmus stuff was was like East Enders, right? So absolutely get liquored up and sit down with your bottle of Shiraz or whatever it is you're having yourself and, and get stuck into it. Very entertaining. But actually, when it comes to something that means anything, then it's got to be Ireland this year. And they have been one of the stories of the rugby year. And I do think the only concern I'd have is the very obvious one is that we're all chips in on Sexton now. There's no... Uh, there, There isn't, when it comes to Sexton, nobody's talking about a gamble on the guy's quality or what he's delivered over the years, right? But it's a huge gamble on his age. And we're going to end up... We are going to talk about this for 22 months and he's going to be injured at times. He's going to be back in the team at times. No. But we are saying now we're Joey not Carver's going back. to blood... Yeah, and look, well, well, yeah, and like it'll be Carberry, obviously na- nailing place kicks, and be you fine. know hadn't shown hadn't shown amazing form for months before that to the point that you were feeling that maybe his position was under threat. But yeah, look, and maybe he does stand up in that way, and maybe that will be grand, and maybe Sexton plays all the games up to the World Cup and gets injured just before the World Cup, and it'll still be grand. But it is, 
it is definitely from Andy Farrell's point of view. He sat down and I, spent a lot of time with his coaching team, weighing up whether this is the right call to make. And two, it is an all chips in on Sexton bit. Two points, right? It's actually the England game that's the turning points from an Irish rugby perspective, and that's the one that I would put in the. So we beat England, who have had the absolute hex over us since we thought we were going to win the World Cup and slalomed into a game at Lansdowne Road where they just exploded and hammered us and then they've hammered us ever since. And so we beat them under Andy Farrell and that's the turning point for Farrell. So I think the November franks that and I would argue if you're going to put an Ireland thing in. But the, the one that actually has an impact on the future of rugby, like what Rasmus did in that week off in between the first and second test, if you remember the second test was about seven weeks long. The actual match itself... Yeah unending because of all the pressure that Razzy Rasmus had put on the officials. He ruined the game and he got exactly what he wanted out of it and they won the test series and for South Africa all they care about is winning the test series because it, it actually feeds into their the stereotype of their national psyche. Everybody hates us. We're at the end of the world. We can't even join leagues properly. Blah, 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 blah. That, that mm. kind of, it's us against the world. So it worked really well for them and I think it's going to work really well for them in, in building a team to win the World Cup again. And then the other thing I'd say is that I, I kind of have to agree a little bit with Nathan that like the November series for New Zealand, like they're, they're, they're in the interim period here between a World Cup where they didn't win and what, what tends to happen is after a World Cup that they don't win, they come back and they win one. Yeah. And so they're working out styles and you've got snipers from the edge going well I've got a very strong opinion on what I saw out there but I'm just not going to tell you what it is mm. and like you know so the, that's I, I think that they're they're going to be cured by that and so I don't know maybe it is a peak for us maybe we're out of cycle again I, I think it's going to be the interesting part of this conversation as well if we're looking at you know moments that we can take from this conversation we just had and clipped them and played them in two years and looked like idiots is, is the New Zealand thing and playing that audio from News Talk ZB uh, like I mean you rewind from a World Cup two years if you do that from the last World Cup, the Springboks were after getting pulverised by Ireland in Dublin. What was it, 38 something? It was Ireland's biggest ever win against the Springboks. They did sack their coach after they did, that. They did sack their coach, but I mean, that could happen in, in New Zealand as well. I mean, even even if you like go to the Euros this year and you look at Italy, rewind a few years to them, and I mean, what was the last major tournament that they tried to qualify for before Euro 2020? It was the 2018 World Cup, which they failed miserably to do so. Fast forward a couple of years, they're European Cup champions. It is uh, very, very interesting to see what can happen over the, the, a small period of time, especially with a country of that much power. And I think that That'll be the moment of this time capsule where we have to look back and say, God, remember that when think, uh, the Kiwis were up in arms? Yeah, I think one, one final point. I, I just was on Wikipedia checking how the, the results and the sequence of games in the Six Nations and I didn't realise how successful a tournament it was for Ireland. While we finished third, we won the Millennium Trophy, but we also won the Centenary Quach. Yep. Do you know did. about the Centenary Quach? Oh, when we beat Scotland. Yeah, I didn't know this. Yeah. And, and and we now have a, a strong lead. It's eighteen fourteen. It was first presented in nineteen eighty nine, and uh, it's like that weird kind of the shield. Is it? Is that the one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a drinking vessel. Is it a quake or a quack? Oh, quake, quake, quack. I have no idea. Q U A I C H H. I say H. Mm. Was there was there a trophy handed out after Ireland beat New Zealand? A oh, special trophy, yeah, Nathan. <laughs> The day, the day of, but they seem to have a trophy for every November Challenge Trophy. They seem to have a trophy for every. There's match more anti rugby agenda here. Oh, oh no, here, the, just the, to be the, clear, just to be clear on this, in case this is clipped up, and I'm you hate rugby. sitting down over the next couple of days trying to enjoy my just new to be year. Clear this. I don't think this was a friendly. I don't think any of that. Rugby. I think it was great that I beat New Zealand. I think you can read a lot into it, but at the same time, I think if we're putting, you know, you want Razzy Erasmus's video. If this is if this is dug up in fifty years time, people want a good hours entertainment. They want to sit down and watch Razzy Rasmus and yeah. go, who the hell was this guy? You know, and I just say as well, in terms of in terms of setting the record straight here, I, I am definitely not writing New Zealand off, even under the current coach. Like they've won the the rugby championship this this season. They if you're going to get a kick up the arse, right? Two tight games, the South Africa be, game being one of them in the rugby championship in uh the Gold Coast, wherever it was. A, a most un New Zealand like defeat in the last couple of minutes where they kick over a penalty was Jordy Barrett and a couple of points ahead and then uh, give, giving up a penalty themselves later on tiny margins and the one in Dublin as well uh, at a point could have gone either way all I'm saying is if that's the kick up the arse that you need you've still won the rugby championship well, okay you've lost a couple of games to Northern Hemisphere teams but did you, uh, I don't know that they are they, they've obviously catastrophised out there in a big way did and you maybe see the France game that catastrophic. the France game so there's, there's, there's a kick through 
where it's 29-27. France are two points up. New Zealand are, are attacking down the right wing. There's a kick through. There's a chase. And it's going to be touchdown for a try or it's going to be, you would assume, touchdown for a 22-metre dropout. Entomac gathers the ball in his own end line. Runs. Shivy of the hips and runs the length of the field and they don't score immediately off it. But it is one of the most exhilarating moments that you've seen in rugby in a long time. And if there is a moment that should go in the mm, uh, in time France. capsule in two years' time, when France are winning the World Cup, you're like, that is the moment where they're like, we are the greatest team in the world. Yeah. Yeah, fair point. Nathan, I also agree with your point about, you know, sitting down for a glass of wine over Christmas and all of a sudden you get a notification from off the ball and you're like, when did I record this? When, when, when on earth did this happen? I think, it was la- I think it was like on New Year's Eve last year, I got a notification and it was like, you know, 10 new notifications on Twitter. I went in and everybody from Cork was at my door being like, oh, the mask has slipped on this nasty individual uh, because I had some argument with Colin Bowie about that Kerry Cork game which had been seeded out about two and a half months after we recorded it. So I, I feel your pain, Nathan. And this morning could be that morning, of course. You can see with the stocking over my shoulder we are here live with you uh, in the build-up to New Year's Eve. Jer, Nathan, Adrian, thanks a million for being with us. Have a can very happy Can I just say before I go, I have one last thing to say before I go. Um, can you let me know because I really wish I was on to talk about the football moment of the year of you know Mayo beating Dublin and when are you going to be talking about yet another great Kerry bottle job we're actually going to be doing it next year. do you have anything to say about great. the GA year Nathan we've got like uh, uh, just, give us a quick I think uh, my second. entire highlight of the entire year was the final whistle in Crow Park when Mayo beat Dublin yeah I can imagine. How did the Magic. final go? I was I was right beside you there for the final. Well, that, that little heartbreak. Like, I, I should I should have known right from the start when I was sitting beside you. This wasn't going to be an enjoyable day for <laughs> for anybody. Regardless, <laughs> part of me was thinking, is this really how I would like to celebrate a Mayo? You're, you're final welcome. Day? You're welcome to the ticket, Nathan. Don't worry. Uh, so uh, we are talking GA next. Ashling and Tommy are on standby. But first, here is one of our most viewed clips from the entire year. So Michael Reynolds, Leinster GEA secretary, was one of the few voices prepared to put his thoughts on championship reform on the record. He told us at the time why he opposed Proposition B. It's funny that the footballers of Longford think this is the right solution for them, but that the Leinster Council doesn't think it's the right thing for them. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. what they said. They've come on the show and said that they think that. All of them. <laughs> The Mickey, Mickey Quill did say on behalf of his entire dressing room that he has yeah, spoken to I, teammates and, and they are all in favour of this in fairness, Michael. Yeah. And in two years' time, them players won't be there. So will we have the next group coming They're in? more likely to be there with Proposal B than they are in the Dennis state Carton, as well. 10 no, years I ago, said them. he couldn't get players to commit to Longford because of what was happening in the in the Leinster Championship. Well, That's 10 years not, of this. Do you not agree yeah, with that? No, I don't. You think I players, you think players are, are, are not going to refuse to play for their, the weaker counties because they're tired of getting humiliated? Refuse? That's an extraordinary word to use. No, it's not. You, that, you it talked did. to Dennis Connerton. and he, could, he, he said he phoned 60 people to try and fill his panel. Yes, yeah, so some of whom had said they were retired, so I doubt if he can count them in. So you don't accept that it's a problem that players in the weaker counties will stop playing? That's... Hold on a minute. Show me the contracts. It's a free... Anybody can do what they want. Do we not want them to play, Michael? Yes, but I would not criticise any player who says... I'm not doing it. I'm just saying a club. If I was sitting on the bench for six months and all I was doing was cannon fodder for a training session, I'd have the same attitude. What if you're cannon fodder for Dublin or Mayo yeah, once or, or Kerry? Year. Yeah. Well, what's the uh, point in that? No, what's the point then in any sport? So if you think you're going to go out Because you, you, you want a competitive, you want to be able to win Division 4 or Division 3. Correct. You want to play in front Absolutely. of a... F- you want to play no, in front of a full bad. crowd in summertime. The same, you, no. want to, you want to play for as no. long a season as as all of the other better teams. That's, well, that's no, our argument for Plan B. Yeah, for, for most of the teams, as I told you, the league is finished on the 2nd of June if it happens. Then it's straight knockout. So, like, every day you go out, now we're back talking a bit of sense now because some of what we went on with there wasn't exactly facing up to the fact that in sport, yes, you will have hammerings, whether you like it or not, in any sport. Now, you, as you said yourself there, you can blank the defence and, and reduce that. But the point of the bidding is, yes, in Division 3 and Division 4, yes, if you have potential wrong robin in the provinces that's linked to the All-Ireland, yes. So basically, fundamentally, we're agreeing on most things. It's just we're not agreeing on the fact that uh, proposal be as a provincial championship, a uh, standalone competition in February, uh, the end of January, February, March, and the first week of April. Yeah, Michael Reynolds chatting to us during the year in the build-up to the special congress that uh, I guess saw the end of Proposal B and the end of any hope for championship reform in 2022. We are doing our 
uh, time capsule for 2021 at the moment. We're putting in our favourite moments from the sporting year, the moments that will stand the test of time over the course of the next little while, or perhaps not. And we are talking about GEA at the moment. Ashling O'Reilly, Tommy Rooney, you're very welcome, folks. Hello, Owen. Hey, Owen, how are you? Good. So let's actually just reflect on that moment for a moment. The Michael Reynolds uh, comments, the failure <laughs> of proposal B. Is this uh, an isolated 2021 moment, Tommy, or do you see this as actually something we look back on and say that was the beginning of change, that was the beginning of the revolution? Well, well, I'm actually just thinking about our the concept of the time capsule at the minute. Uh, if, I, if I get this right, we're going to bury this time capsule, are we? Yes, and, and somebody's going to open gonna it, dig up. it up again. We don't know when we're going to dig it up. So we kind of need an opinion that's going to stand the test of time. Something archaic, dinosaurial. Maybe I should change my moment and put in something that was said <laughs> about Proposal B. Maybe that, maybe that will work, no? Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Mm, no, I don't want to do that. We subjected ourselves to too much during that that whole debate. There was 31 pieces across off the ball. Do I think it's going to be the the moment that the revolution started? I sure hope so. I really hope so. Um, we saw how easily change can happen in the GEA when they were forced to with the pandemic. Things were changed and it looked like we learned some stuff. And then we seem to go back to the future. A couple of weeks ago, the preseason competitions were slipped back in. We're back into, I don't know how the season's going to work next year. There's a condensed calendar, so many games, meant to be a split season. I think for a lot of players, it's going to be a 12-month season between county and club. Um, I don't think we've learned many lessons. And uh, does that give me hope that change is on the horizon? No. Well, I'd say there'll be plenty of time to, to chat about this. We do want to kind of like get through some of the moments uh, that we mm. do want to put in from the time capsule. Ashley, we might start with yourself here. Uh, like, I mean, we've got to meet people on the line. Is that a suggestion of where we want to go with, with your suggestion for the time capsule? Yes, it is. But uh, for all the right reasons, not just because we're meet people, um, because <laughs> they showed up and it's a, a, a big moment in the sporting year that should be talked about. So, yes, uh, my moment is the Mead women's team uh, winning the All-Ireland Senior TD Carter All-Ireland Final. Just absolute scenes um, when they lifted the Brenda Martin Cup. It was magic emotional and surreal surreal mm. is is definitely the way that i describe it um i was up in the press box of Cora Staunton, crying my eyes out uh, i i never thought that would happen but i just couldn't control my emotions at that time um to see the hill filled with mead fans the flags flying high it was a scene from the 90s that i thought that i, I was never going to see again um yeah so it was just really magic and if we're talking about things that actually point towards other events that might be happening down the line, I guess this is a really interesting one in terms of what Meath have shown to teams across all codes about what you can do in a short space of time. Like that, that, that is the, the sensational nature of this story. Like, I mean, obviously you had the Offaly under-20s winning and that was a, a similarly emotional moment. And not to kind of compare the two moments at all, but with those underage teams that can come along and it's a great generation and, and, and it leads to this one burst of a year. And I'm sure that awfully thing will lead to, to great senior success as well. But this, this was the Mead seniors. This, this took a long time to get, to get together or it should take a long time to get together. And yet for a lot of people coming to the story just in 2021, it sort of felt like it happened overnight. Absolutely. And I think just to give a bit of a backstory um, for people that might look at this in 10 years' time, so this was a four or five years in the making. Um, we saw new champions for the first time since 2004. You know, around the, the county, around the country, there was really a sense of they've nothing to lose. This is great. You know what they've done. They've made the final. Sure isn't that exceptional. You know, that sort of vibe is what I, I got off people in the run up to the final. But behind the scenes in Mead, I felt for many and of course the team, you know, they were quietly confident. And what it stood out most, I think, was their style of play and the consistency in which they, in which they did it. So the, the quarterfinal against Armagh, that was the telling moment. Before that game, uh, you know, I said, this is really where we'll see where Mead are at. And they left Armagh rattled. Um, and that put them on to play Cork in the semi-final. That was a massive challenge. I was on OTB AM with UO and co-presenting. Mm. And I said, Mead are going to be Cork and it's going to be a Mead Dublin final. And the amount of messages I got after that saying, are you mad? Why would you go on saying that? Like, it, you're only starting out as well, me sort of in this, uh, you know, reporting world. <laughs> and they said, geez, my mom even said to me, oh God, Ashley, like, you know, <laughs> you can't be biased. And I said, no, I, I'm serious. You know, I, I believe that they're going to do this. I wouldn't say it otherwise. And to be fair to Cork, you know, they had one foot into that All-Ireland final 
Mead struck two goals in the last minute to force extra time. And it was just a spectacular collapse by Cork, to be honest. You know, I'd say they look back now and it kills them. You know, that they were led by seven, 55 minutes to go. But Mead went on anyway to win 210 to 212 after extra time. Um, they done it then, you know, it was the Mead Dublin final. And I think for the Royals, it's the biggest rivalry there is. You know, it was an exciting game from start to finish. Could have went either way. But again, we played with this attitude of nothing to lose. They really showed up on the big day when it mattered most. And that's a true sign of champions. You know, um, Emma Duggan, Lobin, Dublin goalkeeper, Kira Trent. That was probably a significant moment. Um, and Mead went on to win 111 to 12 points. So just to give a bit of a backstory, but as you said, Owen, the significance is, is what comes away most for me. You know, how it's inspired men, women, kids, even just people that aren't involved in sport come up and say to me so many times now, like, geez, just to see an underdog rise to the top in the way they did and show everybody, you know, with work, dedication, a bit of belief in yourself, what you can go on and do. So, yeah, I think the significance and what it did for the game is probably what most people around the whole country will take away from this. T- Tommy, why weren't you in that baying mob in the hill the, when me won the All-Ireland that day? <laughs> like, you might have been, actually. Uh, oh, I, I wasn't. No. Like, I can't remember why I wasn't there. I, could have had, I, I, was, I missed the court game because my own team were in the process of throwing away a seven-point lead in injury time. And I listened to the Mead ladies come back on the way home down the road, back to Clare. So, um not saying I felt sorry for Cork. I was absolutely sad. I pulled over in Longwood and uh, could hear the celebration. I was like, oh, I turn on the radio. You could hear the you could hear the comeback coming on. So listen to the rest of that game on the way home. Um, I don't know why I wasn't there on. Sorry about that. I, I, I can't think. I can't. Where, where were you when here. you were watching? Like, where, where were you when, when Mead lifted? I was in Clare, but I don't, I don't know why I wasn't. I wasn't at the game. Um, but it, it was unbelievable. I think, Ashley, like you've spoken about it during the summer a couple of times with us. Like, when you talk about the heights that they got to this year with the All Ireland title and where they were five or six years ago against Cork, mm. they lose by thirty odd points. Was forty it? points. Forty in 2015. points. You know, like, and it's like in twenty fifteen, like it, Emma Duggan probably wasn't even starting secondary school back then, and yet <laughs> yeah. she's the one kicking unbelievable scores against Cork and against Dublin to lead them to this All Ireland title. Like Mead have a couple of mm-hmm. generational generational talents on their hands. Like yeah. I was watching the All Star Awards there a couple of weeks ago. Um, they were on TG Car after one of the club games. And it just, they, they rattled through some, some of the scores of the summer. And the points that they were kicking were absolutely outrageous. Some of the all time great points scored in an All Ireland semi final or final, receiving a ball over the shoulder, turning, burning defenders, swinging it over the bar. It was, it was just the, the, the level of quality throughout the summer really captured people. And I think, Owen, you were getting at it at the start. Mead won the intermediate title in December. Yeah. You know, they won the league title. Yeah. They won Division Two in the league then. Was Division Two in the league the one then earlier in the summer? Yeah, they uh, they won that at the start of this year. So they won Division yeah. 2, yeah, against Kerry. Yeah. So, so like in, in the space of a year, they'd, they weren't, they'd gone from not even being intermediate champions to being senior champions, all in the space of t- 10 months. And uh, it's incredible. And like Ashley mentioned it there, it's the first new winner since 2004. Like it's been four, yeah. Dublin, Mayo, Cork who have dominated this. Like, there's been yeah. there's been no room for anybody else. There hasn't been a, a look-in, never mind on the All-Stars, but on the, all, the All-Ireland back. And Mead have, have come through this year, key pack plastered across the jersey. It's just it's been it great. Like being it's back to the be. future. Yeah, yeah. It, absolutely. It, it did seem like I mentioned the the awfully twenties there. It was the third part in the trilogy of ridiculously emotional moments in Croke Park around mm. that uh, what was it, maybe three four week period. And then, Tommy, I know this is what you want to put into the time capsule, but I know it's a yeah. semi final. But it's kind of hard to look past the Mayo win against Dublin. That is one of the really significant GA moments of the year as well. Well, I'm I'm just going to rephrase it a little bit there. On the the moment of the summer for me, actually, I think I'm putting in Dublin being beaten. Yeah, fair. I think that was more significant than Mayo beating Dublin um, in kind of a grander sense. I know for the people at Mayo, it was huge and there was such emotion and it was incredible to be there and to witness that. But to actually watch Dublin, Dublin's bid for a seventh All-Ireland title in a row just disintegrate in front of our eyes. I kind of got a, a front row seat to it. I know, Ashton, you were covering a lot of the Ulster games. You got to get a great view of Tyrone and you called Tyrone just like you called <laughs> Mead. You called Tyrone earlier in the summer. Yes, tell me. <laughs> I, I happened to get to a lot of the Dublin games. So, you know, I was sitting there beside Paddy Andrews in Crow Park as Mead had a rattle at them for about 15 minutes. I'm not going to talk about Mead again in this, but like, it felt like there was something happening that day. I was like, geez, they actually have a chance here. And I know I was on off the ball over the last couple of years saying Mead had a chance to beat them, that I could see chinks in the armour. I think I was a little bit, I was probably raving a wee bit then. But that day in June, 
you could see they're actually getting at them here. And then Kildare didn't really put up too much of a too much of a fight in the Leinster final. He rolled into the All Ireland semi final, and there was just was it was it half was it around half time or something? Just after half time, Mayo came alive, and it was just like they're on the ropes here. And Robbie Henley getting a second bite of the cherry. I don't know whether you had a moment like that, Ashley, in Crow Park this year or own if you've experienced a moment like that before as well. But it was absolutely surreal. It, it was a minute to go. He gets the free. He puts it down. It's like, can, can he do it? Like, you're watching it. You're like, can he do it? Paddy Andrews hasn't said a word for 15 minutes beside me. And Henley puts it down. I said, oh, he's missed it. He's missed it. And he gets another shot. And he buries it. And you just knew from there that was it. Dublin were beaten. And Mayo come out in the second half. Some of those moments when they chased down the defenders, turned them over. Um, there were just some incredible moments in it. But it was just watching Dublin fall apart in front of your eyes. And it's because they are the greatest we've seen. They're the greatest I've ever seen. And, and we've any of us ever have, have seen. Maybe somebody who's a little bit older can, can argue the fact that that Kerry team and Mikko's Kerry were better. But this Dublin team, in terms of the skill level, the application, the work behind the scenes, the quality of the players, the general depth that's in that squad, what they've achieved... Like they are the greatest we've ever seen, and it just it just fell apart. Now there are extenuating circumstances. They did lose about 190 All Ireland medals. I think it's about 87 in the six months prior to that. Their captain Stephen Cluxon had walked away. There was the COVID training scandal in April. Things were just falling apart all year long, and you know what it does? It sets up, and it's such a pity. It's such a pity that we haven't got a new structure to look forward to. But it sets up next year's All Ireland. There is anyone who can win this next year. I was just about to ask Tommy are you willing to bury this time capsule in in the ground concrete over it and etch into it RIP the dubs 2015 to 2020 and and walk away from that or are you waiting just another year just before you finally finally bury that hatchet there is absolutely no way in hell it's the end of the dubs but like you you interviewed Brian Fenton a couple of weeks ago and a really good chat but you could feel the hunger you could see it. Like, that was the first time Brian Fenton had been beaten in championship football. Like, how incredible is that? Like, that is just, that's ridiculous. So you can only imagine what that has done. Like, obviously, the the, the hunger and the drive and the, the want to win all Ireland. And when you're up there, you don't want to be knocked off your perch. But when you do get knocked, there has, something has to click. Like, and if it mm. doesn't, I, I, like, if it didn't click, there'd be something wrong. Do you know, there'd be there'd be something. It would be that you've been fluking your way to it. Like if something didn't click, if you didn't have that in you to want to go back and prove yourself, you so need to only, feel. You need to know what it feels like to lose. I think I you, know, you like, need to have yeah, that. I feel like Fenton was nearly saying that. That like that, that was nearly the best thing. And I, I'm sure you can paint it in retrospect and in hindsight. And I don't know what you felt though, in listening to him, but like it feels like that's what Dublin needed a little bit. Like Conor mm-hmm. Callaghan, Kieran Kilkenny, Brian Fenton, even the likes of Brian Howard. The younger lads, they, they probably need something a bit different. This is going to be their team now. It could be a new generation of, of dubs coming through now. Like, But um, well, what, do I think it's the end? I think it's the end of the greatest. I think the greatest was hmm. 2015 to 2020, 2019. 2015 to 2019, I would say, is the greatest. I think even 2020 was a different era. It was Desi. Um, but I, th- I think that that era is over. But like, you could have a new era come through now. Well, well, if we take it in isolation, then just for next year, Ashling, what, what do you reckon? Do you, do you expect an immediate rebound? Because I, I agree with Tommy, there are so many different factors at play here which would almost ensure that Dublin are going to win all Ireland again in the future. But it's just how near into the future that is. Yeah, oh, I wouldn't be writing them off. And I've had this conversation with so many people over the last uh, few months of, oh, is that the end now? We're not going to see them again. But I wouldn't be one mm. to be buying into that whatsoever. You know, they're an unbelievable team and they just have so much talent coming through again and again. And as Tommy alluded to there at the start, you know, they did have a bit of upset the whole way through. There was a different story coming out constantly. We didn't know why Cluxton had left. You know, there was all these speculations going around and that's what surrounded the dubs when we were used to watching them being so perfect and Mm -hmm. everything was just so right and they don't make mistakes and Every, you know, the, the subs that come off the bench are as good as the lads on the bench. And they, the, you know, it, it's, it was always just so perfect. And this year we've just seen so many little stories, little mistakes. And then against Mayo, they fell apart. So I think it was just, yes, as you said, an end of an era in that, in the sense of that team. But I do think there's so many young lads coming through and they'll be absolutely a force to be reckoned with. I would not look past the dubs at all. But as Tommy said at the start, you know, this is so exciting now because it's anyone's game. 
Yeah. Nobody said Tyrone at the start of the year. And look what they went on to do. So I think that'll put a bit of fire in, in lads' bellies to say, look, geez, even the Mead story, you know, anything's possible. Go out and have a bit of belief in ourselves. You know, it would have been good to see the change. You now I think to have more games and all of that for, for maybe the smaller counties. But look, this is the way it is for this year. So I still think there's that sense of like, you know, we can believe and go out and a bit of dedication, hard work and anything's possible. For sure. And I think that that's the commonality between the two things that have gone, gone into our time capsule today mm-hmm. is that the Dubs getting beaten uh, is a significant moment in both of those championships, which make them a really dangerous animal for next year. Maybe this time in 12 months, we'll be sitting here thinking, God, uh, how foolish were we to think that it wasn't a guarantee that Dublin were going to win both championships. But uh, time shall tell. Ashling, Tommy, great stuff. Thanks a million. Thanks up the so Royals. Much. Up the Royals. <laughs> <laughs> right, that is uh, our Gaelic football slot. Uh, we are turning our attention over the next little while to a bit on the Olympics, a bit on tennis, uh, a bit on boxing and a, and a few other things besides as well. Uh, so here is an OTBAM hurling highlight before that from 2021. It is the one and only Kilkenny legend, Tommy Welsh. We'll be back in one moment with Colin Buig talking tennis and rowing. You have, in, in all sports, you have players that are competitive you have players that, you know, will train hard, will do everything that's asked for. And on the big days, you know, they will turn in, you know, good performances. But then you have the geniuses. You look at the darts, and you're looking at the darts, like you have Van Gerwen, you have, you have the power. Like, you get an extra few thousand looking at these, uh, looking at the sport when these geniuses playing. To say that when DJ Carey was playing, and Gore and Aaron's, when they were in the county final, there'd be an extra 15,000 people in it to see DJ Carey, you know. So, you know, it's, it's Messi, Ronaldo. You, you clue into these games just to see these guys. They made the the diff, most difficult things, Johan Cruyff always said it, they make the most difficult things look simple. And that's the key. Well, 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 Colin Buig, welcome back to the time capsule on OTBAM. Do you remember this lot last year? Do I what, Owen? Um, it's now fast turning into our traditional Cork loving, as I'm sure you're uh, well remembering of last year. Mark Keane and the last minute uh, wonder goal, I would yeah. describe, really, against Kerry in the semi final last year. Lou Connolly's assist, Jim Connolly be proud of it. Uh, it was an amazing time um, in an otherwise dark era for the world. Uh, Cork brightened it up as usual. And here we are in 2021 with uh, possibly an even better accomplishment well, I, 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 so we, 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 will leave, we will leave that Cork positivity for just one moment but I'm sure as, as you're aware like I'm, I'm just looking into the ground right now I've got my shovel out and I'm digging up our 2020 time capsule column and I'm looking at Cork beating Kerry I'm looking at this as you yep. know that significant moment that was going to change the relationship between Cork and Kerry forever how did that work out in the intervening period Colm? It was just a really great moment on and um <laughs> You know, that's why it was in the time capsule. And I think it just brought the nation <laughs> together on that early November night. Uh, it was a Sunday. Everybody had the fear. And then um, people were just watching. Oh, we certainly had the fear that night. Uh, yeah. And um, it was just a really great moment. And that's that's what sport is about. Oh, that's what life's about. It's full of moments. And um, thankfully, on, on that dreary winter night, Cork were able to brighten it up. Yeah. And um, then we fast forward to summer 2021 on. And um, who cares, basically? It went brighter. No, I mean, it, it, we added to it. Just like our own personal sporting reading in the years, we added to it. And um, and again, that's what it's all about. Oh, and that's what we're here for. Right. And I'm just glad to be uh, from the county that's um, offering up these these moments of uh, wonder. Words. Um, incredible word soup there, Colm. And I, and I like your evasion tactics, but we do have to talk about the greatness of Cork. We, we, we will give Cork their dues because uh, this was... I, I, I want to say, Colin, this was like extra impressive given uh, their favourite stags. We are talking about yeah. the rowers and their gold medal at the Olympic Games because I'm not going to lie, it scared, it scared scared me a little bit going into these Olympic Games and everybody was talking about Finton and Paul and that these two lads were clearly the best in the world at what they do, that Ireland are expected to win a gold medal and are raging hot favourites to do so. Nothing sends the shivers down the spine of an Irish sports fan more than heavy favourites tags. But these lads cool as a breeze and roar to victory I'm sure you shared their confidence throughout the, the couple of weeks of, of the Olympics I did and uh, it made it all the more exciting that Jonathan Rammelman and Jason Osborne from Germany really gave them a brilliant race and for the first like 500 metres Germany floated the traps and it was all part of the tactics that afterwards 
Uh, Paul and Fintham are saying you know, that they were they're taking the solely, I think they usually do. And then by around the thousand meter mark, it was still fairly close, but the last 500 meters, they just went out in front and showed the class, particularly Paul. And um, I think Fintan was saying afterwards, you know, like the guy's a monster. And I was actually, I was watching it back last night and this morning and um, the commentators, like the European commentators were saying, you know, this guy, Paul O'Donovan, they were just talking about him to the casual viewer and saying they were describing him as a monster as well. And that's what right. Fintan said afterwards. And it was like, you know, he just made his job a whole lot easier. <clears throat> and then Fintan himself saying, I was actually surprisingly relaxed on the day. But I'd say he was, you know, a handful of people that actually were, because as you say, that was nervy, wasn't it? That race, like, as you say, going in to be favourites, and then over halfway through the race, Germany aren't letting up, like. And uh, it was just those last 500 metres were just amazing. And Ireland's first ever gold in rowing at the Olympics. First gold since 2012 when Katie Taylor won the boxing and first male gold since Michael Cruz in 1992. So... It was a, a monumental achievement, and uh, as you like, to favourites to actually follow through on the favourites tag is so un Irish. Mm. That's what makes it brilliant. What I would also ask is when was the last time, say, it's probably Katie Taylor is the answer to this question, but I was going to ask, like, when was the last time that somebody went into an Olympic Games as famous as Paula Donovan, an, an Irish Olympian, that is? It sometimes feels that we're very reactionary towards our athletes mm. naturally because they do something that maybe they're not expected to do and all of a sudden they become a celebrity like the O'Donovans in 2016 but all of a sudden you know you got Paul O'Donovan anyway back in the boat again back in the Olympic Games in this huge level of, of fame and expectation and this character that had already been built like I don't, I don't really remember the Paul O'Donovan interviews from this summer like we just remember his, his sporting exploits that it, yeah. like the, 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 the celebrity aspect is, is so different and the thing that I wanted to get around in a very roundabout way of asking you here was at the start of lockdown, we you were the first person to deliver your Mount Rushmore, or maybe the second person, and you had the, the very tough task of etching yeah. out four faces on the Cork Mount Rushmore. Does Paul O'Donovan now get on that mountain as a result of him winning two Olympic medals, a gold and a silver? Yeah, I thought that we brought up. I mean, they won the Henny Regatta as well after the yeah. Olympics, and um, Paul's a three-time world champion, I think, at least. Um, God like one, he's close, isn't he? But... You were asking the question there at the start, it was he the most famous Olympian heading into the Olympics in our in you know recent times? And I suppose the only person to rival that maybe was the person who did get on the Mount Rushmore, and that was Sonia O'Sullivan yeah. going into 2000 in Sydney when she got the silver. Um, look, I can't change those four, and I knew this would be brought up, but you know, Jimmy Barry Murphy was the one that was omitted there that was very much seen as the fifth Beatle, and uh, I think like Paul is number five now, isn't he? And for many people he'd be in the four, no bother, but so, I'd keep oh, the four. JBM didn't make your mountain, did he? No, no, it was Christy Ring. Was the, oh, Christy Ring. So the, uh, you're putting the GA representative. Yeah. So Christy Ring is, okay, so or sorry, JBM is down one place on the rung. And yeah, down, in the ahead. power rankings, yeah, the Cork Mount Rushmore power rankings, which is a great idea for a segment, actually. That's really good call. Um, yeah, he's number six, I'd say, and Paul's gone up to five. Um, okay. But yeah, like it's just because the CV is so stunning and... Um, like that's a really good point you make too in that at 2016 at Rio alongside brother Gary when before they got the silver the first real breakthrough interview on national TV everyone's like my god who are these guys they're mm. catchphrase phenomenons and uh, I think you talked about it the morning after this year too or at the Olympics when they won was you know was that a bit of a novelty after you know we didn't know what it was going to be yeah. and then after that it was like they went on Graham North and the lads and they became a bit celebrities but then it turned out that no, I mean, Paul is actually world-class. Yeah. And he just happens to also have a great personality. And uh, another thing too is, well, he was able to pull off that long hair like nobody's business, you know, in the full beard. And uh, you think that would slow him down, if anything. But his no. technique, by all accounts, is absolutely phenomenal. And, uh, phenomenal. Yeah. And uh, it was just, um, yeah, it was just great to see uh, an Irish athlete perform uh, at the top level, seemingly without many nerves, and actually pulling through and showing that we do provide world-class athletes. And, and of course, I mean, Cork will uh, lay claim to, to some of the other rowing boat, of course, with uh, Emily Hegarty, Afro Kyo, Yimmer Lam and yeah. Fiona, yes. Fiona Murta uh, yeah. alongside Emily in, in that boat as well. So, I mean, everybody expected it to be a very good Olympics for the rowers and it was. Before we let you go, Colin, we can't have Colin Buig on our screens without talking about tennis. What, what is your tennis moment of the year to go into our time capsule? Uh, I think it has to be Roger Federer losing the quarterfinal at Wimbledon to Hubert Hurkacz. We actually talked about it the day after on OTBAM. Um, 
you know, that could be the last match that Roger Federer ever plays. And for it to to be at Wimbledon and to lose that third and final set in that match, six love, to lose, you know, straight sets to a to a good but not great player in her catch. And, you know, for Federer, it, it was this, Wimbledon is the scene of his first and 19th of his 20 Grand Slams. He's won Wimbledon eight times. And to go out like that in his final set of tennis on centre court at Wimbledon, six love, hopefully won't be his final set of ATV tennis. But um, it was a real sad moment to watch. It was tough to watch. And uh, for such a great player who became such a, he was such a huge part of people's childhoods. It, it was kind of Muhammad Ali-esque. I think that's what we discussed too towards the end. It was kind of really tough to watch. And with all these surgeries he's having on his knee, he has different priorities in life now. Who knows if we'll see him again. It doesn't diminish his legendary status by any means. Um, and at the time of speaking, he, Djokovic and Nadal shared 20 Grand Slams apiece. Don't think that's going to last much longer. But for many, Federer is the greatest ever. But it was such, you know, like time capsules doesn't have to all be positive. No. This is just, you know, a, a completely unforgettable sporty moment for me anyway and for many others just to see Federer about like that because you know he so rarely loses six love you're talking a handful of times in his whole career so um hopefully it's not the end of him in some capacity but um in the documentary of Federer in a few years time which I know doubt there will be that will you know play a pivotal role in, into the narrative of that match yeah for sure 2021 the last year you can legitimately cling on to the notion that Novak Djokovic actually is <laughs> yeah. the GOAT uh, that's exactly. that, that, that's that's where I'm leaving that one, Colm. Thanks, Millie, for being with us, Colm. Uh, I guess. All right. Uh, uh, Continued success to the county of Cork in 2022. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you very much. Well, have, appreciate a, that. have a happy new year. That is uh, Colm Buig with us. Now, 2021 will be forever remembered for Euro 2020 and Tokyo 2020. We are talking boxing and football next as Ronan Mullen and Phil Egan put two more moments into the OTBAM time capsule. And when it comes to boxing, there's only one place we can start. I'm kind of a, a strong-minded person, like so. Once I set my mind on anything, then then I can achieve it, you know. Kelly is a, a fantastic and amazing human being, first and foremost. She loves boxing. She must be the best. She is the best in the world at the moment. We can see her going to out to Tokyo, winning the gold medal. If all our stars are aligned, she, she's that special. I was going down the wrong pathway. Academically, not very smart, but streetwise, very smart. Boxing is very well known in the inner city. There's a boxing club on every second corner nearly. So uh, that was how I ended up getting into boxing. And the discipline in boxing is the best discipline that you could have, really. Pillars of the arch, so that when I left, I'd always leave me mark. Olympic final, gold medal on offer. Kelly Harrington, Beatrice Ferreira. Here we go. You never know like, when someone is born or when they're on the journey if they're going to be an Olympic champion. But I think when, when as soon as she got to the Olympics, I mean, I, I felt that this is it. Like, that's, that's a stage, you know what I mean? Wrapped in the curves of your Nice job. Lovely right again. And a swing and a miss from Ferreira. Harrington boxing absolutely brilliantly in there. Can she persuade the judges? I still don't see myself as anything special because I'm, I'm not like I'm, I'm still do the same things all the time. Like I haven't got superpowers or anything. Like I'm just a normal person, and it's great. You know, I love it, but I also love people being real and saying, "Yeah, you might be a world champion, but you still have to do this." You know, like you're still like you know you're you're no better than anyone else. Like you know, we're all we're all human, we're all equal. Like. Again, going to take a backward step. What a fight this is! Beautiful left, straight down the throat from Harrington. To be able to to give my community Dublin, Ireland, something to be excited about and look forward to. That's the real emotional part, you know. Like that means so much. Like to be able to make people smile and let them have something to be happy about, you know. There's not a lot to be happy about at the moment, so. This will hit people, hopefully. Last few seconds, Shirley Harrington has done enough in the lightweight final. Bang! There's the bell. What a performance. Akuna Matata. It means no worries for the rest of your days. She's done it! Olympic champion, Kelly Harrington. Goal for Harrington. Goal for the darling of Dublin. She's a hero, Kelly. You're done it. Thanks, God. And thank Ellie and all your good neighbours 
Just absolute magic moment from 2021, really. Probably the sporting moment of the entire year it is Kelly Harrington winning gold in Tokyo. Richie McCormack's brilliant Gemma Dunleavy montage there as well. We're going to have Ronan Mullen with us in just a moment. Phil Egan is here in studio. We're going to do Euros with Phil in a moment as well. But this is a little bit of an off-the-brawl reunion we're getting going here. It's like I'm not even asking people what their sporting moment was of the year because it is impossible to top. Kelly Harrington's gold yeah absolutely You're, everyone's going to remember where they were when Kelly Harrington won a gold medal I was in a, a hotel room in Croatia watching it on an iPad and yeah just you got that sense in the third round she's going to do this you still have that nervous weight because you know how boxing can go judges can go a certain way but it's just a brilliant display just the way if you follow her journey and it all came down to this and it, it was just Obviously, the with the Olympics being pushed back a year, certain people missed out. Uh, you probably think it worked against them. I think of somebody like Sunita Paspori, where I think it went against her. But with Kelly Harrington, it did her no harm. And um, yeah, she was just in supreme shape and just so focused. And you heard the sound bites there. She was just a breath of fresh air. And then I always just think, you know, on the biggest stage to pull out that performance, switch hitting, going in between styles, orthodox southpaw. Yeah, it was just, it, there is no better moment than a high of the year. No, and Ronan, I think you're with us now as well. Like, nothing makes these moments more special than having to get up in the middle of the night to chart people's progress. And just, I know we had you on every single morning after probably 30 minutes sleep from, from the night before, Ronan, and giving us updates on what had happened overnight. But just getting up at three o'clock in the morning to watch Kelly Harrington or whoever it was, just completely cements this in your head as something that you'll never forget, even though an Irish person winning a gold medal is probably unforgettable in itself. Yeah, that's it. And I suppose Olympic boxing being the zenith that it is, all the fights are competitive by their nature. They're going to be very close. But I think we were all set at ease on Kelly Harrington's first Olympic outing, obviously her debut at Olympic level. And she just took to it like a duck to water and never looked back really as the the competition got stiffer and stiffer, no, none more so than that final where we, we obviously gave it the big sell because... I think she was an underdog basically as she went into that one and first round was a little bit dicey but then she just clicked into gear and showed that she's one of the best boxers on the planet and we should be very proud of that The final itself Ronan like because the I don't remember much except for it being an absolute cracker what, like what, what, what what's the, the, the recollection from your perspective of what actually happened that, that morning So like Ferreira by her way was go- always going to bring the fight in physical terms you know her best path to victory and had been her successful path to victory for many of the years leading into these Olympics was just to come with all that ferocity and outgun the opponent basically and the first round though though closer probably in retrospect than we probably pegged it was going for Aira's way certainly in terms of the pattern of the fight that she wanted to establish but then as Phil was alluding to there Kelly has so many strings to her bow and she was able to adapt on the fly basically in between rounds and she was always keen to give her coaches credit but there is a sense that the fight of themselves have to be quite proactive they're the ones in there and they know what's working and what's not and to turn the tide in an amateur fight which is obviously three rounds and it's something we spoke about a good bit over the Olympics so and that the, the winner of the first round typically won the entire fight and for Harrington to turn all that around spoke to how brilliant her performance was and the outpouring of emotion which greeted that on the morning in in studio and elsewhere and then like obviously in Tokyo it wasn't quite the rapturous attendance that we would have loved but you know the the entire Irish boxing team was there and it's the the beauty of the modern day is that Kelly was quickly able to appreciate how engaged people over in this part of the world were by the whole thing and it just made for a great occasion. Like I mean it's it's hard to think of too many more people who are as beloved in the Irish, in Irish sporting in Irish life, uh, let, let alone Irish sporting life uh, at the moment. And if you picked anybody from the lineup that you really wanted to win and succeed at, at these games, it was always going to be Kelly Harrington. Yeah, and just uh, something that Ronan touched on there: the, when she actually the footage of when she's shown videos of the reception that she's or the the crowds that are following her around where she grew up, she's just can't take it in. Like she's just blown away by it and. It must be just the strangest feeling that obviously 
we knew she was a medal hopeful going out there, you know, a, a world champion. And she goes out. But the difference of a before and after when she steps on the plane to go and when she comes back, it's I'd say it, it's still probably something that she struggles to comprehend. Uh, she takes it all in her stride because that's just the kind of person that she is. But it must be very strange now that everywhere she walks, like she's the everyone recognizes her now. But and whatever she does throughout the rest of her career, she has that Olympic gold medal. She is an Olympic champion. And yeah, when when her hand gets raised, like as I said, I was out of the country, but it's hard not to be so proud to be Irish because, and I remember the night before, I was telling people, I was like, I'm getting up early, I'm watching Kelly Harrington, she's going for a gold medal. Like this is You had two hours extra in bed than us, Phil, let's not forget. <laughs> Yeah, I no, I think it was an hour. Oh, just an hour, okay. Just the, just the hour, but uh, yeah, you're, you're just bursting with pride. And then later on that day, I was actually out for, for lunch and the, the local station was obviously showing Olympic coverage and her final came on again. Now, there was no sound in it, but again, I was watching it and you just sit there and you just think, you know, for, for such a small country, um, we just produce brilliant boxers and she's she's in that conversation and rightfully so. Yeah, how many times have you watched the back rolling since? Oh well, you had to kind of. It was on repeat, as Phil said. There was kind of you'd catch clips of it in the subsequent days, but just looking back at it, you know, it was just the most immaculate performance. And her semi-final, similarly, so that was never going to be overly straightforward. But she she made relatively light work of that, as much as you can do at the top level of the sport. But um, it's going to be interesting to see her next move. Obviously, there was plenty of perspective pro offers for her but she's decided to stay amateur and the the obvious carrot there is that unfortunately the Olympics was obviously postponed this past year and 2021 obviously for the 2020 games but that means the likes of Kelly only have to hang around for another three years for their next crack at it and you wouldn't rule her out uh, going for medals again in Paris For sure, I, we didn't even ask you what you wanted to put into uh, the boxing time capsule, it was just such an assumption that Kelly Harrington would be there but if Kelly Harrington's moment didn't exist, how else would you sum up the, the boxing year running? Well, Owen, I think our boxing coverage over the last couple of years, there's always sort of these, there is a hint of negativity that we have to kind of acknowledge in these things. And I suppose Tokyo offered uh, something of a, a punctuation after what was Rio and the, what befell us there. And the McLaren report obviously came out in the last few weeks post Tokyo and copper fastened what we already knew that the likes of Michael Conlon and Katie Taylor were done over in Rio so in one sense Tokyo drew a line under that because it was such a success as you said uh, Kelly was brilliant but also the entire team captured the imagination in some ways like as much as people in boxing were familiar with the Walsh's I think everybody appreciates them and what they've done for boxing and Irish sport at large and again you'd, you'd certainly back both of those to be medal hopefuls in Paris and, and it goes on and on Kurt Walker was like a big Kurt Walker fan personally and it was delighted that again he got onto the big stage he's since turned pro so it's going to be interesting to see how he goes but this is all exists on in the with the backdrop of what's going on with the IABA and it feels like we've seen this movie before with Billy Walsh where mismanagement has jeopardized some of our in-ring talents and also our coaches and you know what's going on in the joint directors committee towards the end of this year kind of shows that we're kind of retreading that path again so it's kind of danger territory and if people are watching this back in a couple of years it's going to be interesting to see how this is dealt with because we lost Billy Walsh and we don't want to be losing the the current coaches that we've got and also the the fighters that will hopefully be in Paris aren't swayed to turn pro given the uncertainty that's around the sport in this country at the moment. What about then outside of Ireland and the, the pro ranks because the heavyweight sphere has obviously been tarnished a little bit for obvious reasons over the, the, the past couple of years but separate from that not that we can separate it uh, the sport has been incredible yeah the heavyweight picture um like you would have thought a couple of years ago that vladimir klitschko such was his stranglehold on the division that his ascendancy in this century of heavyweight boxing was almost unassailable but the resume that tyson fury has started to put together now is certainly putting him in the conversation, like he's obviously beaten Klitschko, so that's, that that speaks volumes, obviously, but also the uh, the wins over Wilder and what he might do now in terms of a win over Anthony Joshua just to c cement himself. If he can beat him, it kind of, not that, I think it's fairly conclusive now that Fury's the number one in the division, but if he can clean out all of his contemporaries as well, I think 
you're going to have to start talking about him in the rarefied air of, of past heavyweight generations. So that's probably one for, for people to keep an eye on. And also, even though Fury is the, the top of the crop at the moment, the intrigue around Anthony Joshua is, is always so interesting because as we approach 2022, this is such a crossroads moment for him where there's always been some speculation around his his training, whether Rob McCracken's the right guy to lead him, his styles. You know, he started off as a bit of a bruiser and has tried to turn himself into more of a technician in the pro game. And he's kind of caught between two stools at the moment. So again, there's a huge amount of intrigue around Joshua to see what what he's going to do next. So that's uh, for the first time in a good while on the heavyweight division is riddled with a lot of interest. So I think people can be excited about that for the next few years. I'm going to put this to both of you. Dream fights for 2022. Phil, do you want to lead us off here? Um, I've always wanted to see Wilder and Joshua. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd be interested to see how Usyk would get on against Tyson Fury. Just the the size difference. Um, you know, it was something we talked about regularly on Off the Brawl, where it was the the triangle of it was Wilder, Joshua, and Fury. And I always felt that Fury was top of it. No one would beat him as long as he was at the top of his game. And I mean, obviously, he's had his demons in the past, and you know he's he's in a good place at the moment so I kind of felt once he stayed like that then nobody beats him um, I, I would still feel like that Th- that's in the, the, the heavyweight division looks like we're going to get the fight that we wanted to see about five years ago Can and Kell Brook don't even care anymore <laughs> um, like it's one of those you'll watch it but it just won't be the same it'd be like watching Masters football yeah yeah it's a bit too, bit too late for that one Ronan are you, are you along the same lines there? Yeah, well, aside from Jake Paul, obviously, Owen, we want to see what he does in 2022. But apart from him, we've got, I say Joshua Fury, if that can be made. We're talking about heavyweight fights that are fights that slipped under the radar. And there was plenty that Phil and I discussed over the years that just didn't materialize. So we'd like to see some of those get made. Like Katie Taylor against Amanda Serrano, that looks like it, it will happen. So that's kind of the marquee matchup in women's boxing and would really put it over the top in terms of the strides that have been made in recent years to to attain parity if you can get the two best female boxers in the world in the ring together that's the best possible recipe we saw it towards the end of November here um, a great win for Terence Crawford against Sean Porter and if he can fight Errol Spence that's obviously that's possibly the best fight that can be made in all of boxing and just on that same theme like we we look at bygone decades and and the, the best fighting the best and we haven't quite got that but if those two get it get it on and similarly in the lightweight division that we've got you talk about the four kings of years gone by with Hagler Hearns, Duran and Leonard in the lightweight division now we've got something similar with Javante Davis, Tiafimo Lopez, Ryan Garcia, Devin Haney so any combination of those two fighting would be great as well so there's plenty to be cheerful and then from an Irish point of view our next world champion if we're looking down that path Michael Conlon has his fight hopefully in St. Patrick's Day in New York so he could be if we're looking at future pro prospects, I think that's our best bet. And then just elsewhere in Irish boxing, just that from a more personal point of view, you'd like to see the likes of Eric Donovan and Ray Moylet and these guys get the fights that they merit and that they're, the work they put in the gym deserves because uh, reaching that point in their career where I'd like them to achieve what they want to achieve, but also go out in their own terms and get the fights that they want. So hopefully from an Irish point of view, those things come together as well for sure um, that is the boxing section of the time capsule Kelly Harrington though uh, clearly the moment of the year in the ring we just want to finish up this morning on the football uh, Phil has brought a wonderful wall chart in with him he's uh, a fully completed Euro 2020 wall chart Yeah, uh, we're going to dig out a couple of moments from this what what, what is your go-to moment for, from the entire tournament for, for the time capsule I, I did worry about, um, about half time of the final it was like when I have to fill out that last part of the, the wall chart I thought am I going to be putting England down on this mm. or Italy um, obviously we know what happened in the final but I'm going to go back to Monday the 28th of June Monday madness I described it as because you know you, you, we obviously work early in the morning and you're home in the afternoon you've got the last 16 to start and everyone's really kind of talking about the, the Germany and England game um, Belgium and Portugal they're the real standout last 16 ties Monday, Spain, Croatia. You think two teams that like a bit of possession could be a technical game, low scoring, but um, an enjoyable one to watch. Then France are playing Switzerland. France are the world champions. They're the favourites for the competition. Switzerland have Granit Xhaka. Yeah. Jordan Shakiri. 
you know they're, they're you know Switzerland you know always good in qualifying they might get out of the group but that's about it France are going to start to show exactly why they're the tournament favourites so it'll be a fairly routine Monday you think not how it turned out it was the most mental Monday and for those people that weren't really mad about international football they always get reminded at every major tournament what's so good about international football and that that Monday was just crazy obviously with the Spain-Croatia game it starts off with a bizarre own goal where Pedri pings one back at Unai Simon is that in that game? yeah so then Simon obviously lets it go under him and Spain are 1-0 down and you think Spain haven't been very prolific because Morata hasn't been banging in goals but Spain turn it around they go 3-1 up and you think that's it it's game over Ferran Torres is uh, at the forefront of it then you know you hear the two goal lead is a dangerous one Croatia come back they get it three all it goes to extra time and actually Morata pulls out an unbelievable goal in extra time where ball is played across and he's towards the back post and he takes a touch with his right foot onto his left foot lets it bounce oh, yeah. and smashes it in and you think of some of the misses that he's had during the tournament and he puts that one away then they obviously they finish the job off 5-3 after extra time you know I'm fairly shattered after this yeah. this has been a roller coaster France Switzerland yeah I, I don't know how this one's going to turn out Switzerland go one that up Seferovic scores then they're gifted a chance to go 2-0 up early in the second half when Pavar concedes a penalty which went to VAR and you're thinking oh my god they're going to be 2-0 down here but Ricardo Rodriguez misses his penalty decent save from Lloris a couple of minutes later Benzema pops up with an unbelievable goal do you remember where Mbappe plays a ball into him it's slightly behind him he flicks it it comes through his legs not quite Burkham besk against Newcastle but kind of is similar then obviously Jan Sommer comes out to him he just kind of flicks it over him then a few minutes later France go 2-1 up again lovely play from Griezmann and Mbappe Griezmann tries to dink it over Summer. He gets a hand on it, but it goes up in the air. And Mbappe's back post, or sorry, Benzema's back post, heads it in. And you're going, this is why Benzema was brought back for this tournament, to win it for them. And then Pogba scores an unbelievable goal. It's 3-1, 15 minutes ago. And you're just thinking, wow, France are unbelievable. This is what we've been waiting for. And uh, yeah, Switzerland score with 10 minutes to go. And then they score an injury time and Clive Tilsey um, comes up with the line basically saying just uh, nobody's going to bed just yet. Oh, yeah. And actually straight after that, Kingsley Coman, who you know was pulling the strings uh, in extra time, he actually missed a really good chance, hits the crossbar in injury time before it goes to extra time. Yeah. And then obviously extra time plays out. Mbappe had a really good chance. And th- the fallout from the penalty shootout. But if, if you remember, there's a moment in extra time where Pogba plays this lovely ball into the left channel and if Mbappe is on song he probably he probably lets the ball get into a position where he'll just wrap his right foot around it but he actually waits so long for it that by the time he tries to strike with his left foot he slices it wide but if you actually the camera angle you can actually see Rabio throws his hands up almost to say what are you at? How have you missed that? And obviously we know there was a, a bit of beef there with Rabio and Mbappe. Well, they're, of course, yeah. Their mothers. Their entourages, yeah. Obviously, nine penalties scored out of nine, comes up to Mbappe, goes to the keeper's right, good hand from Sommer, and uh, that's it. France are out. 28th of June, 2021, was, I think, is oh. the, the greatest day of football ever because like, you take one of those games and... You say that's a good day of football, just one of those yeah, games. But two, two of the, the greatest tournament games back to in back. history, back to back. It was incredible. With, with such a small turnaround, because obviously the first game started at five, the second game at eight. Mm. But because the extra time brings it beyond seven o'clock, like where you barely have time to eat. Yeah. So then you go straight into it. It's just, it was just unbelievable. What, what a summer. What, a, what an incredible yeah, tournament. It was a brilliant tournament. And I think just the fact that it was all, coming off the back of a season with no fans and then all of a sudden yeah. you start seeing packed stadiums atmosphere it all matters VAR was well marshaled and then obviously you get a game like you get two games like that where it was just it was just incredible um, so yeah that, that day just stood out and there are those kind of nights where you know obviously I'm up early every morning 
You're not getting to sleep for a few hours. The and, adrenaline yeah. is just flowing. And you don't actually mind. Like sometimes you get up some mornings after, um, after like a not not a not a dull game, but like yeah. after, after, and you're like, was that worth it? Was that worth oh, it after four like hours sleep? The, the night of the final. Yeah. The night of the final, I probably didn't go. I, I usually get up at five every morning. Probably didn't go to bed till two o'clock. Yeah. I watched the, the match in my parents' house. Then I went home, started watching back highlights. Uh, watched the penalty shoot out a few times just with the different commentaries wanted to hear what they thought about it on the, the BBC or ITV obviously I'd watched it on RTE and then all of a sudden it was 2 o'clock but I was <laughs> I was bouncing in here on Monday morning I nothing was going to stop me I'm surprised that that didn't make your time caps because that England getting beaten in the final wasn't number one I presume it's like the, the close runner up yeah yeah no, it, it, and it's the obvious one but I just think that Monday was, was sensational some yeah. of the goals that were scored as well and yeah, I just, I, I just think anyone that thought, you know, I don't really like international football, just go back to Monday the 28th of June and uh, have a word at yourself. It's going to be remembered, though, for the, uh, do we call it the, the Battle of Wembley or the, 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 the Wembley Way? Was, yeah. was, was there a name for it? Was there a name for the scenes outside the stadium? No, it was just crazy. I remember, actually, I was listening to the English radio that day in the build-up and... Um, they were already at Wembley Way and they were saying, oh, it's busy. And I just thought, I remember it was about half 12, one o'clock and I thought, I think a lot of these fans have gone way too early. Like this is seven hours before the game and they're already on it. So what are they going to be like when the game starts? How do you think Guy would flare up his arse as Spence this Christmas? Do you think he's like looked back in the year like us, wistfully thinking, you know, what a what a great year it's been? Or do you think he's looked back and said, you know what, I've made a few decisions that I regret? Well, he probably thinks I did it all in vain. In vain, it's true. It's true. If if only they'd scored a couple of more penalties. Because if they, they're saying that, like he could end up on some of those um, big fat quiz shows. True, he's not on the big crap graphic quiz that he already no. confirmed. But he, might he was be on unavailable. Few, I think unavailable. He might be on a few lower budget ones. But I could imagine now he could turn up on one of the TV ones where Jimmy Carr is going to bring him out. Yeah, and you just basically they probably line up five backsides, and you have to try and guess <laughs> which backside was the one that That's had the player. Really in. good idea. Yeah. I can't believe we didn't come up with that idea. <laughs> Again, he was he was unavailable. He's got an agent now. <laughs> but yeah, I'd say um, there'd be a tinge of regret from him because as I said he did it all for nothing um, because, <laughs> because England didn't didn't get the win in the end but Luke Shaw I mean what a what a roller coaster of a year it's been for him and Manchester United and the, the, the sort of rise of Luke Shaw yeah. like that could have do, do you think that like things could have gone differently for him and for Harry Maguire potentially had things gone differently for them in that penalty shootout uh, I don't think so because England the way they played they had so much protection and yeah. I, I think actually if you watch the, the final back they they had Italy in serious trouble in that first half and they didn't go for the, the juggler and that was the way Southgate played and people can say whether it was right or wrong it was what got them to the final it was how they, they managed games and they were very hard to beat but Italy were there for the taking and you just felt it was only 1-0 at the, the break that the closer England got to the, the finish line the the tighter they, or the, the more they tighten up and Italy just had that belief that they were going to do it and they are actually I mentioned obviously the the France-Switzerland penalty shootout then the following game Switzerland go out in a penalty shootout to Spain mm. and then the following shootout Spain go out to Italy Italy were the only team in the Euros to win back-to-back penalty shootouts that just shows the, the mentality even when you look at their team on paper they had some really good players but you know they were missing a few players come the final they just have that mentality and belief that they're going to get the job done and um yeah, it was. Yeah. I, I just thought it was a great tournament, but that that Monday was just bonkers. Anyone that says to me, oh, "I'm not really mad about football," I just say, "Just watch that day back, watch please." That day back yeah, for sure, it's yeah. crazy. OTB AM is brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razor. So, so that Monday is going into the time cap of the 2021. I think on club football, is the Super League a bigger story than any game that occurred over the course of 2021? Yeah, and it just escalated so quickly yeah. because we've had this before where you see it and like, yeah, I believe it when I see it, but all of a sudden, it's like, oh my God, this is actually, this could happen. And then obviously quickly one club would drop off, the others followed, and then there was the three that just didn't want to follow for for obvious reasons. But yeah, it, um, it seems so long ago because obviously the Premier League is back up and running and look the amount of money in the Premier League that really is the, the Super League of of European football now um, you can see why the likes of Real Madrid and Barcelona are so so worried PSG can compete but you know they should be walking their league every season 
Um, and then when it comes to the Champions League, you see the dominance of the, the Premier League sides. So. It was the most hollow victory of all time, though, right? The people who spoke out against the Super League during the weekend when it eventually gets crushed, you know, the sort of victory for football. And a couple of months later, now back well, to welcome watching, in Saudi Arabia yeah, into the Premier League. Uh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. No, it, that's it. And, and certain people were, were strong on it. And then a week later, they were settling back into their jobs for these uh, multi-billion broadcasters. So... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, what well, the one thing that always strikes me about that week was the the level of outrage that seemed to come from a place of surprise or being caught off guard by this, as if the greed in football was something that had just yeah. been discovered on that week. Like that, that's I, I just could, couldn't ever get my head around that that there was that level of naivety around football and and even the sort of naivety around some of the the, the fan protests and and like voting uh, not voting but like I mean protesting against this thing and the sort of sitting on the hands nature to the Saudi takeover as I've mentioned and of course Newcastle is not alone in that there have been a couple of other situations of that across European football that it seemed that football decided that this was the one week that yeah, they were going to yeah. have their moral compass this oh, this, yeah. this year and um and unfortunately they, they misplaced it on a couple of other uh, vital moments yeah it's it's the I suppose to liken to something on a, a football pitch, you can you can break my leg, you can elbow me in the head, but don't dare spit don't at me. Spit me. That's <laughs> the worst. That's the worst crime of all. So it was, it, yeah. Somebody decided, no, 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 no. You crossed the line. The line. I mean, it's been so far away, but you crossed it. And yeah, um, yeah it's look. It, it was it was blocked for the time being. For the but time being. we'll be back. There will be a zombified version of this over the next little while, that's for sure. Uh, Phil, great stuff. Thanks for have a happy new year. Yeah, and I'm I, I'm glad I set up my Euro 2020 chart. It's up there. It's not quite as much a prized possession as the the thing over your your shoulder there, the World Cup 90 folder that I have oh, yeah. there. Which is, I mean, that's not only is that um, you know got the the vintage behind it, but there's the bonus autographs that are in the back of that. Oh yeah, of of, this, of every edition or just of this one? No, of that other? one. I just okay. because I oh obviously, sorry, I forgot you brought this in. Yeah, I, I have uh, Paul McGrath, Tony Cascarino, and Jack Charlton's autographs on the back of it. Boy, back then, like when there was no selfies, you shouldn't have donated at the studio, Phil. That was oh no, like that. look, that that will come with me. Yeah, eventually, eventually. Well, we shall see you in 2022, yeah. Phil. We'll see you in 2022 as well. Thanks, many for being with us all year here on OTBAM. That was our 2021, uh, what do we call it again? Our time capsule of 2021, where we took all the sporting moments that uh, mattered a lot to us and put them into a time capsule. And when we'll date them up, I don't know, but feel free to clip Adrian saying earlier on that Ireland are going to win the World Cup in 2023 because I'm 90% sure that that's what he said. OTBAM is brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. Enjoy the rest of the break and uh, have a happy new year. Chat to you later. OTB AM. With Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors.